Everyone, Cody from Mac Telecom Networks. In this video, we're gonna do another small office build. I've already done two videos on this before, but in this video, I'm gonna show you some of the components I use, what cabling we should use, and I'll show you how to terminate the keystones or the RJ45 ends. I'll also put timestamps down below if you wanna skip some parts or if you've already seen them. I'm gonna be switching back between the classic controller and the new controller. I like how the firewall rules and the networks and Wi-Fi networks are laid out in the old classic controller. If you're new here, please hit the subscribe button. Make sure to hit the bell icon. If you'd like to hire me for network consulting, visit www.mactelecomnetworks.com. You can find us on Instagram at mactelecomnetworks, and we have a Discord server, which I'll put a link in the description below. First off, let's take a look at the topology. This is for one of my small business clients, and we'll be installing this gear in about three weeks. So at the top, we have our ISP connection going down into the UDM Pro. From the UDM Pro, we have a DAC cable, which I'll show you how everything connects in this rack sitting behind me. And then below that, we have a USW Pro PoE 24 port switch. We're gonna be adding few Nano HDs, which will be sitting in the office floors. They have two floors, so one per floor. And then we have two Unify 6 long range access points, which will be in the back of the warehouse. This is a very basic network setup. They don't need any advanced routing. They don't even need a VPN into their network. So the networks we're going to create is the LAN network, which will be at 10.0.1.1 slash 24. We'll have a staff network on 10.0.10.1 on VLAN 10. We'll have a guest network on 10.0.20.1 VLAN 20. And then we'll have a camera network on 10.0.30.1 slash 24 on VLAN 30. Before we get to hooking up all the gear, let's go over the components we're going to use. So first up, we'll talk about the cabling. In Canada, pretty much the standard for cabling is for CAT6. We don't use shielded cable as a requirement here. If we're going into a business that has a lot of EMI, we would use shielded cable. There are also two types of different cabling. So we have riser cable, which I typically see installed in homes. And then we have plenum cabling. So we need to use plenum cabling in any air handling space. So for example, a lot of buildings use the ceiling for our air return. And for fire code, we need to have it plenum cabling. If the building caught on fire, the cable would burn slower and also release less toxins. Riser cable is typically cheaper. So we could see a box of a thousand feet of riser cable on Amazon. This is vertical cable and we use vertical cable all the time. But a box is $166.32. If we look at a box of CAT6 Plenum, you're gonna be paying $239. If you're in a building that you needed to connect two different IDF rooms together that are over 300 feet, you would have to use fiber optic cabling. And most of the time you would use multi-mode fiber depending on the distance. If you're going really far and across different buildings, you may have to use single mode fiber. Next, we need to select the rack we wanna use. For most of my small business clients, we use an 8U rack, so you could fit eight switches in there. There are bigger racks. If you go on Amazon, you will see a ton. My preference is to use the open frame style of rack. I just like that. This is the one I currently have in my network room. It's a 15U 19 inch wall mount rack. For patch panels, I use keystone patch panels and there's a few different types. We could see the one right here, which is a basic keystone patch panel. It's a 24 port blank patch panel or you have the one with the tension bar at the back. This relieves the strain on the cable, but is a little more pricey. For these patch panels, all you need to do is terminate your cable with your keystone jack and then pop it into whichever keystone slot. If there's any open slots, you could fill it with keystone blanks and I'll show you that right now. For a pack of 20 black blanks, you're paying $6.99. And this just makes the finish of your rack look a lot nicer. Now we need to look at the keystone jacks. So I use vertical cable VMAX CAT6 jacks and they come in a variety of different colors. So here we see blue, purple, and yellow, and they're about $118 for a 50 pack. We could see on the keystone jack that you could either use a 110 punch down tool or you could use their eye punch tool. I personally love their eye punch tool. It saves me a lot of time. And that's what we'll look at now. So this is the eye punch tool. All we do is put the conductors into the keystone and then crimp it down and our cable termination is done. But if you don't want to buy that, we could buy a 110 punch tool. This is what the 110 punch tool looks like. And I'll show you how to terminate it with the eye punch tool as well as the 110 punch tool. 
This takes more time and I have slipped using it before and cut my finger. For RJ45 terminations, I use the easy RJ45 tool. So this tool allows you to do pass through RJ45 ends as well as regular ends. I only use pass through ends sometimes when it's indoors. I will never use them outdoor as moisture could get into the RJ45 end and blow the power port on whatever's connected. And these are the normal RJ45 ends. These are non pass through. I'll show you how to terminate an RJ45 end as well. And the last thing we need to talk about is the patch cable. So what I use from the patch panel to my switches, and I use six inch slim patch cables. I've used these Monoprice Cat 6A slim patch cables before, and they're really great. Right now, I just order them from a local distributor, but you'll see how they look in the rack when we start connecting the devices. Now I'm gonna take the camera and we'll start plugging in the gear into our network switch, and we'll also do some Velcro cable management on the cable bundle that's going behind just so you can see what it looks like. You're gonna notice a difference in my voice sound as we'll be using the microphone on the camera. All right, and this is the network rack that we're gonna be working with. This is an 8U open frame styled rack and I've already mounted the gear. At the top, we have our keystone patch panel and I put in the keystone blanks and then we have our vertical cable VMAX jacks. These are Cat6 jacks. These ones are white and these ones are yellow. We'll use the white ones for the access points and then we'll use the yellow for the camera. This is the USW Pro 24 PoE switch. It has eight PoE++ ports at the end and then we have 10 gigabit uplinks. And then we have our UDM Pro, which I already have connected to the WAN. This is our secondary WAN port and can only be used for WAN. It can't be used as a secondary LAN port. And then over on my desk here, we have all our equipment. So we have our two Nano HDs, we have our Unify 6 long range, and then we have our G4 dome. On the top, you can see the cables that are connected to the keystones in the back of the patch panel. And if we follow the cable, these would be the cables that would be sitting in your ceiling or in your walls. So the first thing we need to get connected here is our switch to our UDM Pro, and we'll be using a DAC cable. Usually I use a 0.5 meter DAC cable, but all I have is one meter. So what we do, we grab the DAC cable and we just slide it into the SFP Plus port. And then we grab our other end of the DAC cable and do the same on the UDM Pro on port 11. Now we can see that the link is connected by the white light. If you have just the normal USW24 switch, this won't work right out of the box. You need to go into the Unify configuration and hard code the speeds for one gigabit per second. Now what we need to do, we need to connect our cameras and our access points to our switch. And we'll be using the six inch slim patch cables. These ones are black, which we'll use with the yellow keystones. And then I have red ones that we'll use for the white ones. So all we need to do is grab our patch cable and then start plugging them in. So we'll plug in port 12 and that will go into port one of the switch. And then we'll just do the same across the board. Okay, now our top ports are plugged in. We need to plug in our bottom ports. And now all the ports are plugged in and it looks really clean and minimalist. There's no activity lights on the switch right now because we haven't plugged in any of our devices yet, but the activity lights will go on once they're plugged in. This switch will provide the power to the access points and the cameras. Now what we want to do, we want to Velcro our cables together. We don't want to use tie wraps as it could pinch the cable. So all we need to do is have a roll of Velcro and then cut some pieces off. Now we grab the Velcro and wrap it around the Cat6 cable. Now we have one piece of Velcro on, we could put a couple more pieces behind it. And we have three pieces, now we could just slide this one piece of Velcro up. And now that's making our bundle neat. Now with our bigger bundle of cable, this is all eight of the cables, we could do the same thing. We just need to cut bigger pieces of Velcro. So all we do is wrap it around the Cat6, pull it tight, and now we have a piece of Velcro on here. So I'll put a few more behind here and then we'll just drag it down the cable bundle. Now we have five pieces of Velcro on the bundle of cables. We could straighten out the cables with our fingers and then slide the Velcro down.
And after doing this, it makes your bundle look a lot neater. Now we need to plug in all of our devices into the end of the cables. I have all the devices plugged into the keystone jacks. Usually you would have the keystone jacks in a box or in a faceplate in the wall. And you would also have the caps on the top of the keystones. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to leave them as is. If we look back at the switch, we could see that all the lights are on for all the devices. It's getting power and there's activity going through it. I'll show you how to terminate the keystone jacks and put RJ45 jacks on. So first we'll start out with the vertical cable VMAX keystone jacks. And you can see on the side that there's these color codes. So we have T568A and T568B. Depending on the part of the world you live in, you may use one or the other. I use T568A. T568B is commonly used in the United States. On the jack, we could see the teeth where we need to put in our conductors. Hopefully you could see this all right. We have my Cat6 cable and I'm using a pair of cable shears or cable scissors. All I'm gonna do is grab the scissors and then score along the jacket. Then I'll just pull on the jacket and then pull off. Now our conductors are exposed. There is this cable pull string that you could pull down and then you could cut around the jacket if you think you've nicked one of the conductors. I've been doing this a long time and I know I didn't hit one of them. So I'm just gonna cut the string off. And then depending on the standard that you're gonna do, you need to follow that color code. My first color will be solid green and then white green and then solid blue, white blue. On the other side, we have solid brown and then white brown and then solid orange and white orange. So I'll place the jacket into the keystone. We wanna make sure that the jacket is as close to the keystone as possible to avoid crosstalk. And I'll grab my first pair, so that's my green and my white green, and I'll just twist. And as you can see that the conductor is going into the tooth, then we could push down. And now the conductor is seated, so we need to do the same for all the other pairs. Now all our conductors are in the keystone jack, we need to get our vertical cable eye punch tool. Now we grab our vertical cable eye punch tool and then we put the keystone into the jack. Once it's seated properly, all we need to do is pull down on the crimping tool. And you can see the conductors fall off and our jack is now terminated. Next, I'll show you how to terminate with the 110 punch tool. All right, so I already have the conductor put in the keystone jack and this is the 110 punch tool. On the top, it says cut, that's the cutting edge and we want that to face the outside of the jack. So what we need to do, we need to grab the 110 punch tool, put it into the slot and then push down. It will make a noise and we need to do that on the other conductor. Sometimes when the blade isn't sharp, this one isn't too sharp, it won't cut completely through so you could just twist it off. But you want to make sure that the conductor is pushed right down. So now we need to do that for the other three pairs. As you can probably see, the eye punch tool is a lot easier and time saving. Even though you need to buy proprietary VMAX jacks from Vertical Cable, it is worth the money. Now let's do the RJ45 terminations. And this is the RJ45 end. I also have a clear boot. You don't need the clear boot, but it does make it look a little nicer. So I'll grab my cable and then put the clear boot on. We'll grab our cable shears and then we'll score the jacket of the Cat6 cable. And then we'll pull the jacket off. We're gonna wanna cut the pull string then again, we're gonna to wanna to follow a standard. So either T568A or T568B. So for me, I'll be using T568A. So the first color pair will be white, green, green. So we untwist our conductors and then we just straighten them out. The next color will be white, orange and then we'll straighten it out as well. And then we wanna use solid blue and then white, blue. After the white, blue, we're gonna use solid orange and then we'll use our white brown and then solid brown. You wanna to try to make the conductors as straight as possible. And then you could grab your cable shears and then just cut them in a straight line. After we cut it, we wanna grab our RJ45 end and make sure that the tab is pointing down and then push it onto the cables. The cables are now seated inside of the RJ45. We want to bring up the clear boot. 
And with the clear boot on, we grab the RJ45 crimper and we push the RJ45 end into the crimper and then we just crimp down. And now our cable termination is done. So that's it for the physical part of this. Let's get to the software and configuration. Well, now we have the physical side done of things. So we need to work on the software side. First, we need to get our UDM Pro up and running. So it says device name UDM Pro. I'm gonna call the device small office, and then we'll accept the end user license agreement and press next. We need to sign in with our single sign on account and press next. So I'll go ahead and do so. And then it's going to ask us about an update schedule. I'm going to have this disabled and then we'll press next. Auto optimize will leave on for now. Now it's going to start a speed test and it shows us our speed test. We got 501 megabits per second down and 566 megabits per second up and we'll press next. It will ask us to review our information and then we press finish and our UDM Pro will be online. All right, so our small office UDM Pro is online and we could see that the network version is 5.12.71, which is an older version. So we need to go into our settings and we need to update our UDM Pro firmware. We could see that we're on 1.6.8 and there's a newer firmware out. So we'll press check for update. And it's showing us that there's an update available. So we'll click on that. And it's going to update our UDM Pro to version 1.10.0. And we'll press confirm. The update is finished and it's added a whole bunch of different controllers. So we have our network controller. We have Unify Protect, which will be for our cameras. We have Unify Access and we have Unify Talk. We won't be using these two in this video, but we will be using Network and Protect. First though, we need to change our LAN subnet. If we look back at our diagram, we want the LAN to be in 10.0.1.0 network. If we bring up a command line and I type in IP config, we're getting an IP address from 192.168.1.x network. So we'll go to our network controller and then we'll click on the settings wheel. From here, I'll click on networks and we could see that we only have one network configured right now, which is our LAN network. If we click on the LAN network, we should be able to edit the subnet that it's in. So we could click on advanced. And then we could see that it's in the 192.168.1.1 network and we need to change that. So we'll put it to 10.0.1.1 slash 24. And then we're going to auto configure the DHCP range. So now our DHCP range starts at 10.0.1.6 to 10.0.1.254, and we're gonna apply the changes. So now our PC should get a new IP address, but to speed it along, I'm gonna type in IP config space slash release, and then IP config space slash renew. We can see that our lease has been renewed and we're getting an IP address of 10.0.1.87. So that's great. Now the next step, we need to get all of our devices into the network controller. So we'll go up to the device tab and we can see a bunch of different devices listed here. So we have our USW Pro 24, we have our Unify 6 long range, and then our Nano HDs. In the new controller, the green symbol means that it's adopted into your network controller already and the blue symbols mean that it isn't. So the first one we'll do is our USW Pro 24 PoE. We'll click on the switch and then all we need to do is press adopt. Now this is going to get added into our unified network controller. And once that's done, we could add the rest of the access points. From here on out, I'll be using the classic dashboard. I just prefer it. The only thing we'll be using the new dashboard will be for the threat management. So now while we're waiting for our devices to adopt, let's create the networks. The next network we need to create is our staff network. So we'll click on networks and then create new network. We'll call it staff and then it, the purpose will be corporate. We're going to give it a VLAN ID of 10 and then give it a gateway and IP subnet of 10.0.10.1 slash 24. And then we'll update the DHCP range and scroll down and press save. The next network we'll create is our guest network. We'll call it guest and then we'll give it a purpose of guest. If we give it a purpose of guest, it auto creates firewall rules to block inner VLAN routing and then we'll give it a VLAN ID of 20. The gateway IP subnet will be 10.0.20.1 slash 24, and then we'll update the DHCP range. Scroll down and press save. And the last network we need to create is cameras. We'll give it a name of cameras, and the purpose will be corporate. 
and then the VLAN ID will be 30. The IP subnet will be 10.0.30.1/24 and will update the DHCP range. All of our networks are now created. We need to create a couple wireless networks. The only wireless networks I'll create here are the guest network and a staff network. So we'll go over to wireless networks, click on create new wireless network, and we'll call it staff. The security type we're gonna give it is WPA personal. The password I'll give it is test1234. And then we'll select the network of staff and press save. Now we need to create our guest wireless network. I'll call it guest. We'll give it a password of test1234. And then the network will be guest. On our guest network, we're gonna to wanna to limit the bandwidth to 10 download and two upload. How we do that, we go over to user groups and then create a new user group. We'll call this guest profile. And then we're gonna select the bandwidth limit download and upload. We're gonna switch it from kilobits per second to megabits per second. And then the download speed we'll put is 10. And then the upload we'll have is two and press save. We need to go back to our wireless networks and then click edit on guests and then advanced options. Under the user group, we need to select that new guest profile we created and press save. Now, whenever somebody connects to the guest network, the most bandwidth they'll get is 10 megabits per second down and two up. So let's take a look at some of the firewall rules. So we'll go to routing and firewall and then we'll click on firewall. We look under our guest in, guest out, and guest local. Guest in will have firewall rules, so will guest local. First thing we need to do is to create a group with all of our private IP addresses. So we'll click on groups and then create new group. We'll call it RFC 1918, which is a request for comments. And it's a white paper that you could look up on Google. The first address in RFC 1918 is 192.168.0.0/16. Then we have 172.16.0.0 slash 12. And the last one is 10.0.0.0 slash 8. We're working only in this subnet, but we add the other two just in case we create a network out of the 192.168. It will still be covered by the firewall rules. And then we press save. The first rule we're going to create is established and related. So we're going to create new rule and we'll call it established and related. The action is gonna to be to accept, and then under the states, we wanna check off established and related and press save. And in another video, I'll go in more depth about what all of these firewall rules mean. This will just get you up and running and inner VLAN routing blocked. The next rule will be to drop invalid state. So we'll create new rule and we'll call it drop invalid state. The action will be to drop and then the state will be invalid and we'll press save. So in this network, we want our LAN network to be able to access everything and then every other network to only be able to see their own subnet in the internet. So we'll create a new rule and we'll say allow LAN to all VLANs. The action will be to accept and our source address will be a network of our LAN. The destination is gonna be that new RFC 19 group that we created and we'll press save. Now to block inter VLAN routing, we need to create a rule and we could call it just that, block inter VLAN routing. The action will be to drop and then we could scroll down and the IPv4 address group will be RFC 19 for the source and RFC 19 for the destination. This will allow the camera network not to be able to talk to the LAN network, the staff network or the guest. It could see everything on its own network and the internet. But say we were sitting on our camera network, we would still be able to reach the gateway of each of the other networks. So the camera could get to 10.0.20.1. It could get to 10.0.1.1 and 10.0.10.1. And we don't want anybody getting to our firewall. So we need to go back to our firewall, go to groups, and then create some groups. So we'll create a new group. And this group's name will be to block cameras to gateways, so GWS. In this group, we're gonna put all the subnet gateways besides our own. So the first one will be 10.0.1.1. The second one will be 10.0.10.1. And the last one will be 10.0.20.1 and then press save. So now we could go to rules IPv4 and then all of our gateway rules are done under LAN local. We'll create a new rule and this will be called the same block cameras to gateways. The action will be to drop, and then the source network will be our camera network, 
and our destination will be that new group we created, block cameras to gateways, and we'll press save. Now the camera is blocked to all the gateways, but it could still reach its own gateway. So we need to block out a couple protocols. So HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH. So if we go up to groups, we could create a new group and we could call it just that HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH. And then under port, we want to specify the port. So port 80, 443, and 22. Now I'm just going to create another group with the camera gateways IP. So I'll call it camera gateway. And then we'll put the camera gateway IP of 10.0.30.1 and press save. Now back under the LAN local rules, we'll create a new rule and this will be called block cameras to UDM interface. So the action will be to drop, the source network will be our cameras, and then the IPv4 address group will be the camera gateway IP of 10.0.30.1 and then we'll specify that port group we created. The same rules would need to be applied for the staff network. We wouldn't need to do it for our guest network because we created it as a purpose of guest, which auto creates firewall rules and our LAN network already has access to everything. The next thing we need to do, we need to get our cameras into the camera VLAN. So I'll click on the switch and we know that the cameras are sitting on ports one to four. So we'll click on ports and then we'll click on the camera ports. Scroll down to the bottom and press edit selected. From here, we could switch the switch port profile and put it into the cameras that will put it into VLAN 30. We'll press apply. To speed this process up a bit, we're going to restart the cameras. So we'll restart each one of the four. Now the cameras have restarted, we need to get them into our Unify Protect controller. So we'll click on Unify Protect and then we'll go over to devices. We're going to click add device and we could see the four cameras sitting on my desk and then we'll add devices. So the G4 domes will update if they need an update and then they will be in our protect controller. In another video, we'll go through all the protect settings. Now let's go take a quick look at threat management. So we'll click back on our network controller. And for this, I'm going to switch to the new user interface. And how we do that, we go down to settings, we go to user interface, and then we click new user interface, scroll down and apply changes. Now to get back to threat management, we click on settings and we go to security. We can see internet threat management is grayed out. It's currently not turned on. So we're going to want to enable threat management by clicking the toggle switch. And there's two different ones you could do. There's IPS and there's an IDS. So detection intrusion to my network. Receive an alert when threats or malicious activity are detected on your network or the other option we could automatically block network intrusions. So automatically block threats and malicious activities on your networks. We're gonna choose this one so it blocks. And then we have different sensitivity levels. We have maximum performance or we have maximum protection. If we look under customized threat management, only eight of 35 of the toggle switches are turned on. If we click maximum protection, it will turn on all 35. I'm gonna put it on balanced and then select denial of service and then press apply changes. Under the same dashboard, we could see network scanners. So if we turn on this threat scanner, it's gonna scan every device in our network and show us which ports are open on those devices. And then we have internal honeypots. Apply honeypot to your networks to detect malware, worm, or other types of malicious traffic attempting to scan your network for vulnerabilities. We could turn this on by hitting the toggle switch and then creating a honeypot. You could create a honeypot for every single network that you create and you could specify the honeypot IP if you wish. I'm just going to leave it on the dot two for each network and press create. Now if we want to create it for a staff, we just do the same thing. Same for guests and cameras. Now we'll take a look at the threat management dashboard. So we just go over to the shield on the left hand side and this is going to be an overview of your threat management. From this screen, we could do geo IP filtering. So if we wanted to block out, say, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Russia, whoever, we just click on the country and then we would press block. If you do have a threat management alert, it will show up under the traffic log. All of your endpoint scans will show up under this endpoint scan and then our honeypots will show up under there. 
We just added it so no data has been collected. But that's it for the small office setup. I showed you what gear you should buy, showed you how to terminate network cables, and show you how to do some of the basic configuration to get your networks up and running. If you have any questions about this video, please leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you're new here, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. All right, thanks.